What is up you guys? Welcome back to the channel and welcome to another gruesome get ready with me video. Before I get started, I'm going to answer your burning question. Yes, I did finally put some time and effort into my background. You're so sweet to notice. Oh, and I also dyed my hair. So now that you're caught up with me, how are you? Are you good? I hope you're all doing great, but if not, I get it. This time of year can be really hard for a myriad of reasons, but if you hang in there, I promise things are going to get better, okay? You've at least got me rooting for you. If this is your first time seeing my face, Hello there. My name is Jessica and every week I sit down here and I talk about a true crime case whilst I put on my makeup. So if you're into that kind of thing, you've come to the right place. So perhaps while you're here, consider subscribing to the channel and liking this video. That stuff is super helpful for the channel and greatly appreciated by yours truly. On the other hand, if interspersed with makeup is not the way that you prefer to consume your true crime content, never fear, because just for you, I've made sure to list some other creators down in the description box that have covered today's story in a way that perhaps you may find more enjoyable. And for that, you're very welcome. Now, with all of the YouTube formalities out of the way, what do you say we go ahead and get into today's case? Okay, so... I'm gonna level with you. Today's case is so annoying. <laughs> is that bad to say? I don't know, probably. It is just the most thoughtless, brazen, haphazard, idiotic crime. Bzz. Have you heard of Grant Hardin? If not, just a quick heads up, he sucks. All right, so Grant Matthew Hardin was born on December 6th, 1968. He grew up in Garfield, Arkansas, and beyond that, I really don't know that much about him. So thanks for stopping by. Have a good day. Seriously though, I scoured the internet looking for information on this man from before he was like 18 years old and I could not find Jack Diddley Squat. And that is so annoying for me because I always wanna be able to give you guys like the most complete picture possible. And Grant and his mysterious ass first 18 years on the planet are really throwing a wrench into that. So aggravatingly, college is gonna have to be our actual jumping off point for today. Now, according to Grant's LinkedIn profile, his post-secondary education career began in 1987 at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, where he briefly studied mechanical engineering. However, somewhere along the way, Grant had a change of heart and after just two years as a Razorback, he left the University of Arkansas in pursuit of a new dream, law enforcement because isn't it always? And that's not me knocking law enforcement in any way. It's simply me capitalizing on the trope that people who are either disliked or not that popular in high school always end up trying to become cops so they can go on some sort of power trip. And that is a mold that in my personal opinion, Grant probably fits into perfectly. So in 1990, he attended the Arkansas Law Enforcement Training Academy where Again, according to his LinkedIn profile, he graduated with honors. I cannot confirm or deny the validity of that statement, but if you ask Grant, I guess that's what he would tell you. That said, you're gonna learn fairly quickly that what Grant will tell you happened and what really happened are not usually the same thing. But nevertheless, wherever he placed in his class at the academy was good enough for him to secure his first official job as a police officer in August of 1990. That's when he got hired on as a patrolman for the Fayetteville City Police, a job that he held proudly for all of about nine-ish, maybe 10 months. After his probationary period, he was fired for not meeting the expectations of an average officer. He didn't take kindly to constructive criticism and he seemed to have issues making quick decisions in stressful situations. So um, yeah, they, they can disass. But even after being told point blank to his face that he wasn't a good cop, uh, Grant had no plans of giving up his dreams. Hmm. I guess they were right, he really can't take constructive criticism, can he? Anyways, after his termination from Fayetteville, Grant applied for a position as a patrolman at the Huntsville City Police Department, and against all odds, he was hired. And you may be wondering how he so easily found another law enforcement job while toting around a termination on his resume. And the answer to that question is, really quite simple. He lied. Get used to it. He does it a lot. But regarding this instance in particular, 
rather than tell Huntsville that he was fired for being a dissatisfactory and below average officer. Grant instead created his whole ass own reality in which he was a hero. More specifically, he painted himself as a hero that was fired out of retaliation when he discovered a no good dirty band of corrupt officers that were confiscating drugs and alcohol and paraphernalia for their own personal use. And because he would not, and I quote, bend the law just to keep his job, he was fired. It's like that thing in a job interview when you get asked what your greatest weakness is and you say it's that you work too hard. Like, oh, don't mind me while I pretend something good and desirable about myself is just so bad. <sighs> Unfortunately though, Huntsville was just eating this shit up. They thought Grant was just super duper duper and he was given the job. And he proudly held this job for an epic eight months. Yes, Grant was only employed with Huntsville from November of 91 to June of 92 before he handed in his resignation. And while the world may never know for a 100% fact why Grant resigned from Huntsville, I can tell you that on his next employment application for a job as a patrolman at Eureka Springs City Police, Grant explained that he had resigned because he didn't like the culture of the department and that his superior officers expected him to treat people unfairly. And Grant, being the egalitarian he is, just simply could not stand for this. <coughs> Narcissist, allegedly, in my opinion. <coughs> Excuse me. So he applies at Eureka in late 92 and he's hired as a part-time patrolman in early 93. However, since he was only working part-time at the department, he also had to work a few civilian jobs on the side in order to supplement a full-time income. But in true Grant fashion, he was forced to leave these jobs over personal differences with upper management. Luckily though, for Grant, he was able to move to a full-time position with Eureka Springs in May of 1994, which meant that he didn't even need those lowly civilian jobs anymore anyways. At least I'm assuming that's what his thoughts were on the situation. Because while I'm of the belief that no honest day's work is any better or worse than any other honest day's work, I definitely get kind of an elitist vibe from Grant. Like he thought that because he was a cop, he was better than us regular folk. That's just my speculation. Obviously you're free to form your own opinions on who you think Grant was as a person. I'm certainly not the authority on who this man was. I'm just a lady with a camera and the internet. For example, I can tell you one person who for sure would vehemently disagree with me. And that person is Grant's wife, Linda. Yes, Grant and Linda met in 95, and at least as far as Linda was concerned, the attraction was immediate. She loved her, a man in uniform. Even if he was a complete disgrace to said uniform, she didn't know that, at least at the time. So Grant and Linda dated for about a year before they officially got hitched, and eventually they went on to have a daughter. But even with other people that now depended on him, Grant still proceeded to... How do I put this lightly? Um, he still really sucked at his job. He missed court appearances he was supposed to be at. He got himself suspended from patrol for a month one time when he drove his patrol car down the wrong side of a one-way street. He skipped mandatory department meetings. And he even put a man in the hospital once when he unnecessarily unloaded half a can of pepper spray into the guy's eyes during a traffic stop. We call that excessive force, my guy, cause one, duh. And two, like I said, the man ended up in the hospital and was really close to going blind. So I guess Fayetteville was also correct in their determination that Grant did not make great choices under pressure. But even with all of this, Grant somehow managed to cling onto his job at Eureka until late 96. Yeah, it wasn't until he was caught allegedly falsifying information on a police report that they basically told him to either leave or we'll make you. So in lieu of yet another termination, Grant handed in another resignation and voluntarily left the force. But also he was like definitely forced to leave. So call it termination, call it resignation, call it whatever you want. Whatever it was, was actually the end of Grant's law enforcement career for quite some time. It's unclear whether he decided to take this break or if he just couldn't find another place to dupe into hiring him. But following his departure from the Eureka department, Grant went on to hold civilian jobs for I think around like 13 or so years. 
Yeah, because it wasn't until 2009 that Grant was elected Benton County Constable, which from my understanding is similar to a police officer. They're responsible for keeping the peace and taking care of like minor judicial duties, but they usually only have jurisdiction over towns or townships with really sparse populations that don't need a lot of policing. The craziest thing about this job though was that it was completely unpaid. So on top of whatever work he was expected to complete as constable, Grant also had to maintain secondary full-time work in order to support his family. And regarding this, Grant is quoted as saying, I still have to work full-time, but I wanted to help my community. Get out and use the things I learned as a police officer. Which to me sounds like bullshit, but okay, my guy, go off. I'm sorry, but in my opinion, Grant was just so desperate to get back into law enforcement that he was willing to take the constable position just to feel like he had back some semblance of authority. That said, he must have done at least a semi-decent job of earning some respect back during his time as constable because he served from 2009 to 2010. Then he was re-elected to serve from 2013 to 2014. And in the middle of that second term, he was actually named as deputy sheriff for the Benton County Sheriff's Department. So slowly but surely, he was working his way back into the good graces of the law. And briefly, he seemed to actually be taking his work seriously. He even enrolled in the Northwest Arkansas Community College to work towards a criminal justice degree. It's unclear how huh, the next thing came to be. If you ask me, it's really unclear, but somehow against all odds and despite the skid marks on this man's resume, in 2016, Grant was officially named the chief of police for the Gateway Police Department in Benton County. <laughs> I know, right? Okay, so here's my theory of which none of you asked for. So Gateway is at the northwestern corner of Arkansas, right near the Missouri border. It's a really small town with a teeny little population that's surrounded by even smaller and less populated towns. I actually saw a statement from one person who lived there that said something along the lines of, they wouldn't be surprised if cows outnumbered people in Gateway. So. I'm assuming that they likely just didn't have a lot of qualified people to choose from when looking to name a new police chief. Or they really loved him over there and they thought he'd do a great job. I don't know. Now, ultimately Grant only held onto this position for four months before he resigned, supposedly to focus on his family and his education. But even in such a short time working for Gateway, Grant still managed to make himself some enemies, which is just, Shocking because, I mean, he seems awesome. However, one city employee in particular certainly um, did not feel that way. And in case it wasn't painfully obvious, I was being sarcastic. Grant is not awesome and in fact does suck. An opinion shared by 59-year-old Gateway Rural Water Authority employee, James Appleton. During Grant's four months as police chief, he and James had multiple run-ins with one another and multiple disagreements. I couldn't find specifics of these instances, so all I know for sure is that the two men really seemed to bump heads. But in the grand scheme of things, it really should not have mattered. Once Grant resigned as police chief, their paths likely would not have crossed in any kind of professional scenario ever again. James was working for the city, Grant got a new job at the Northwest Arkansas Community Correction Center in Fayetteville, which was a prison for women incarcerated for nonviolent and non-sex related crimes. So realistically, the two men should have been able to just move on peacefully and forget that the other existed. But unfortunately, that would just not be the case. Which brings us to Thursday, February 23rd, 2017. James Appleton was driving around in his truck, minding his own business when his cell phone rang. He checked to see who it was. He saw that it was his brother-in-law and I guess he also fancied a chat. So he pulled his car off to the side of the road, parked and proceeded to talk on his cell phone. Very responsible, not driving and talking and holding his phone at the same time. We love to see it. However, this decision to be responsible ultimately cost James his life. Because as he sat in his car talking on the phone, Grant pulled up beside James' truck, effectively blocking traffic going their same way. So when another car happened to pull up behind them, Grant actually like stuck his arm out the window and waved them around. You know, nothing to see here, folks. Just carry on. And no sooner did that third car like clear the front of Grant's car 
did Grant proceed to get out of his car, walk around to James' truck, pull out a gun, and shoot James in the face at damn near point blank range. Now being, I don't know, 10-ish feet away from this whole thing, the witness who'd just driven past James and Grant was like, I wonder what that was. Mind you, these weren't two strangers that this person drove past. These men lived in a small town where everybody knew everybody. So when this eyewitness had passed them on the side of the road, he took notice of who it was. Like, oh, there's James and Grant. He wasn't unsure of who they were. They were not strangers to him. He knew exactly whom he'd seen. So he flips his car around, you know, busts a Yui and heads back to where he just came from, just in time to see Grant in his white Malibu speed off down a nearby dirt road and out of sight. And as he gets back to where Grant had been parked next to James, he immediately sees that James is dead. He's slumped over lifeless in his truck. As you can tell, there's really not a lot left of the imagination here. It's pretty obvious what had happened. Aside from the moment that Grant had actually pulled the trigger, this guy basically saw this whole thing go down. So unless someone appeared out of thin air in between Grant and James and shot James and then disappeared before the witness was able to turn around, the only real explanation as to what had just happened was what had just happened. Grant had shot James in the face. So the guy calls the police as one does when one witnesses a shooting. He calls 911, he tells them what he just witnessed, and more importantly, he tells them who he witnessed do it. So the cops roll out immediately, and we're not talking like dick for brain cops like Grant, who just shot someone in the middle of broad daylight in front of a very obvious witness. We're talking real cops who actually knew how to do their jobs. Cops that were able to track Grant down and take him into custody within just a few short hours. They had set up a grid of roadblocks surrounding Grant's house, so all of the ways for him to get home were completely blocked off. So he was going to have to drive through one of these blocks in order to get to his house. And when he did, they were going to be there, ready and waiting to take him in. So cut back to Grant, fleeing the scene of the literal murder he'd just committed. He fucking hauls ass back to his house, busts inside, and he's like, all right, fam, yard work's done. Let's go get some dinner. So Grant and his wife and his daughter all pile into the car and they head out for a nice steak dinner. Obviously he'd gotten home and his family together and back out before the police had set up all the roadblocks. And Linda has since stated that Grant was acting really, really, really weird while they were at dinner. She could definitely tell that something was going on with him. She just clearly didn't know what. But the whole time he just kept telling her over and over again how much he loved her and that she shouldn't ever worry because God would always take care of her. Tell me you're guilty without telling me you're guilty. But despite Grant's strange behavior, Linda just sat there listening to her husband, letting him ramble. She was probably so confused. Love you too, honey. Um, How's your steak? And he's just sitting there waiting for police to swing through the restaurant windows, guns blazing, and arrest him. But they never did. The Hardens were able to have one last nice meal together as a family before the shitstorm of ramifications from what Grant had done came raining down on them. And honestly, it really annoys me that Grant got to do this because James surely didn't get a nice farewell meal with his family, but I digress. So finally, it was when Grant and his family were headed home from dinner that they ran straight into the police barricades. And as always, Grant, thinking he's above the law, rolls down his window and he's like, hey, yeah, I just, I live right over there. So it'd be like super tight if y'all could just let me slide on through here. Yeah, that'd be great. And police are like, oh, or you Grant Harden? And he's like, yeah. And they're like, oh, well, dope. Can you, uh, you step out of the car, please, sir? And once he was out of the car, they cuffed him and took him to the Benton County Police Department for questioning. But before we get into that, let me take my break, throw on my lashes, and when I come back, we will get into Grant's very interesting interrogation. Don't go nowhere. Okay, so Grant's been cuffed and taken to the police station. Naturally and understandably, Linda, Grant's wife, she's wigging out, just losing her mind. She and her daughter actually ended up 
following the police and Grant down to the station. And once the Harden family arrived, rolling in three deep, Linda and their daughter were kept in one room and Grant was kept alone in a separate interrogation room. And thus began Grant's five hour interrogation that in reality probably should have lasted all of about like five minutes. The whole interrogation is available online if um you're really yearning to watch it. I'll make sure to have it linked down below, but it's pretty easy to sum up, which I'm about to. So it starts out like I'd assume any other decent interrogation may start out. Introductions, small talk, Miranda rights. Grant was read his rights almost immediately, as he should be. He signed them, which indicates that he understands them, which he should, because he's a cop and he went to school for criminal justice. But obviously they still have to cover all of their bases, you know, so as to not jeopardize the whole case. So they've gone over his rights, he signs, and they ask him his first question. What did you do today? And Grant responds by invoking his rights. He tells the detective that because he hasn't explicitly been told why he's there, that he'd prefer to remain silent. So the detective is like, no problem, buddy. We're just looking to rule you out of a crime that was committed earlier today. But Grant was still just not interested in talking because he's a cop. A garbage one, sure, but still, he's been on the other side of conversations just like this one. Even if he's never had to interrogate an accused murderer, he's still gotta be aware of the tactics that police use to draw information out of these people. So before he starts just bumping at the gums and spouting off information that they could potentially use against him later, he wants to try and deduce what they may or may not already know. Obviously, yes, we know damn good and well that he knows why he's there. But what he's trying to do is tailor his story and try to get the best outcome for himself. And to do that, he knows it's probably in his best interest to keep his mouth shut until he gets more information. I'll give it to the detectives. They really tried every possible angle they could to get him to talk. We're trying to rule you out. If you help us, we'll help you. If you answer our questions, we can get you out of here faster. Just blah, 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 blah. They really gave it their all. And then some. They tried so hard to get him to talk that I've actually seen them heavily criticized for overstepping with how hard they were pressing him, considering the fact that he'd invoked his right to silence. And while I'm no professional, <laughs> not even close, but in my humble opinion as a lay person, I would definitely say that they were at the very least teetering on the fence of a Miranda violation. Because throughout the course of Grant's interrogation, he must say at least four or five different times that he wants to remain silent. And I have always been under the impression that once you invoke your Fifth Amendment right, the police have to stop questioning you. Otherwise, any information they get out of you following you invoking your rights could I guess be considered coercive and therefore be inadmissible in court. Is that not right? If I'm wrong, please feel free to correct me in the comments. Nicely. I'm openly stating right here that I don't know for sure if that's how it works and I'm welcoming the corrections if they're necessary. So, you know, don't be a dick about it. Anyways, throughout this whole five, almost six hour interrogation, police keep leaving the room and coming back and leaving and coming back and leaving and coming back. And I guess they do this as a way to try and build tension in an effort to get people to start talking. If for no other reason than just a sheer desire to get out of that room. Interrogation honestly seems like just some wild ass mental jujitsu. Seriously, it's like psychological warfare in there. From the windowless room to the artfully constructed palpable tension, just Ugh. I'm sweating just thinking about it and it's not even happening to me. Or Jessica, perhaps you might be sweating because you're wearing a sweatshirt and these lights are hot as dick. My brain is all over the place today. Ooh, speaking of all over the place, you know who else was all over the place? Well, as much as possible, Grant. Yeah, one of the times that the um, detectives left him alone in the room, um, homeboy tried to just bounce. I don't know why, but watching it play out was absolutely hilarious. And when I watched it for the first time, I actually thought he was going to get out because one of the doors did open when he tried it. But I don't know if there were like 
two doors and the outermost one was locked, but whatever the reason, much to his dismay, he was in fact locked in the interrogation room. <laughs> a couple minutes later, the detective comes back in and he's like, hey bro, heard you tried to leave. And Grant's just like, yeah, man, I'm just, I'm ready to go. Like, yeah, I bet you are. But they're not done with him yet. So the detective tells him that unless he has something he'd like to talk to him about, that he can just sit tight and stop jingling the door handles. And then he leaves the room again. And this is where I kind of started to get annoyed with the interrogation because again, in my highly unprofessional opinion, I don't really understand what the play is here. Like clearly he's not talking. And even if he does at this point, whatever he's got to say has to be admissible by now. The man has invoked his right to silence no less than 46 times. And sure, if they didn't have any evidence, I could see the importance of a confession, but they had a decent amount of evidence. So I really do not understand what this detective's raging boner was for trying to get this goddamn confession. It really starts to come across as if it's almost personal, like it's a point of pride for him to try and get it. But honestly, to me, someone with no training in criminal law or law enforcement, a confession at this point really just doesn't seem worth it. It's not like a confession is mandatory to get a conviction, but I'll be damned if our detective friend wasn't going to do all he could to try and exercise one from the depths of Grant's, well, whatever you call the black cloud that hovers around where his soul is supposed to be. The detective even played the family card, bringing in the wife and daughter to, I guess, try and evoke some sort of emotion from him in hopes that maybe that would draw out a confession. And guess what? You won't believe it. It didn't work. So then they pulled the old switcheroo and switch detectives, but it seemed like it was just gonna be more of the same song and dance. SSDD, same shit, different detective. But eventually out of nowhere. And I don't know if it was because the second detective was a woman and maybe he felt less intimidated by her or maybe he thought he could more easily manipulate her. But whatever the reason, Grant did eventually finally start to answer some questions. She got him to go over a decent chunk of what he'd done that day. However, whenever she would circle back to something that seemed like it might lead them into talking about the murder, Grant would just immediately clam up again until eventually he went beyond just invoking his right to silence and he actually asked for a lawyer, which effectively ended the interview. He was subsequently cuffed and arrested for capital murder, which was actually the first moment since he'd been at the police station that anyone had formally told him why he was there. We know he knows why he's there and we know that they know that he knows why he's there, but for some reason they would not tell him what he was being interrogated for, which I kind of thought was weird, but again, what do I know? Okay, so he's arrested for capital murder. He's facing the death penalty if he's found guilty. As I mentioned earlier, they've got a fairly decent amount of evidence against him. Not only do they have an extremely credible eyewitness, but they've also got blood spatter on the passenger side of Grant's car. They've got statements from his wife and daughter talking about how completely fucking bananas he was acting at dinner. I mean, he was definitely looking at an uphill battle and trying to convince anyone of his innocence. And I think he was very much aware of that fact, which I think is what ultimately led him to plead guilty to first degree murder in exchange for the death penalty being taken off the table. Instead, per the terms of his plea agreement, he was sentenced to 30 years in prison with eligibility for parole after 21. And um, I'll tell you what, I don't think that's enough. Do you? Because me personally, I think I'm gonna need Arkansas to explain to me what their thought process was there. You're telling me that you can just hop about your Chevy shoot someone in broad daylight, in cold blood, refuse to so much as even explain yourself, and you can be eligible for parole ever? Not only has Grant shown little to no remorse for what he did, but he's never even explained why he did it or how the hell it all even came to be. Think about it. Why in the hell did Grant and James even cross paths that day? Grant was supposed to be working in his yard, so how did he know that James was going to be parked on the side of the road, 
taking a phone call that he didn't even know he was going to get right at that very time. I don't know, something is just not adding up in all this, and it's really frustrating to me that there's been no real explanation. So I cannot even begin to imagine how outraged James' family must be. So sorry to all the grant stands out there, but I don't think your boy should ever get out of prison. There are people currently serving longer prison sentences for nonviolent drug offenses. And if that doesn't scream that the American legal system needs a serious overhaul, I don't know what does. Now, with all that said, thankfully, karma and the law weren't done with Grant just yet. Once you plead guilty to something like this, you solidify your status as a felon. And somewhere throughout that process, your DNA is taken and it's added into CODIS. And God, what a big fat bummer for Grant, because once his DNA was submitted, the pesky old rape he'd committed 20 years earlier finally came back to bite him in the ass. You see, police had been desperately hoping that someday whoever had committed this rape would slip up, offend again, and get caught, which would finally provide them with the identity of their rapist. And when Grant opened his mouth so they could take his nasty little spit swab, case closed. I mean, it wasn't really that simple, but before we get into that, let's journey back to when all this took place. Rogers, Arkansas, 1997. 27-year-old Amy Harrison is working as an elementary school teacher during the day while she attends classes at the University of Arkansas at night. With hopes of one day becoming an attorney, Amy was definitely a hard worker, which is exactly how she found herself at Frank Tillery Elementary School one Sunday morning in November 1997, even though she was supposed to be off that day. However, despite that fact, Amy had gone into school anyway so that she could get a jump start on some of her lesson plans for that week. She didn't even think twice about going into the school on one of her off days. She loved her job, she loved the school, and she'd never felt unsafe or really even uncomfortable there before. And it wasn't like she was gonna be the only person in that big building. Quite the opposite, really. There was actually gonna be a pretty sizable church service taking place there that morning. I think there were gonna be upwards of like 200 or 250 people there for it. So there would be no reason for her to worry about her safety or so you would think. After working at her desk for about an hour, Amy decided to take a quick break. She went to the teacher's lounge to quickly use the bathroom before jumping back into her lesson plans. But what she could have never expected was that as she walked out of the restroom, she was confronted by a stocky man whose face was concealed behind a beanie and a dark pair of sunglasses. This man was also pointing a gun directly at her. He immediately instructed her not to look at him, to turn around, and not to scream. And before Amy could even process what was happening, the man had pushed her into a nearby classroom where he then proceeded to brutally force himself on her. Amy was completely horrified by what was happening to her, and the only thing she could really think of during the whole ordeal was just how badly she wanted to go home. And that shit breaks my heart, because I feel like it was just another way of her brain saying that she just wanted to be safe. Oh, and the next part, like, chills me to the freaking bone, and I'll explain why. As he was finishing up and pocketing Amy's underwear, which, ew, but as he was just about to leave, the man, Grant, turned and asked Amy, do you recognize my voice? To which Amy's like, um, no. And honest to God, I think that answer saved her life because everybody in town knew Grant. And I think that if he knew she could identify him based on his voice, I think he would have killed her. A hundred percent, I think he would have killed her right then and there. I don't know about you, but that gives me goosebumps. As does Amy's 911 call. Thank you, 911. This is Amy Harrison. Could I just at my stall? Okay. Harrison, what happened? <laughs> Now, rightfully so, this call got quite the response. Not only because obviously it fucking should, but also because Amy happened to be married to a police officer. And I don't think it's any big secret that cops tend to go hard for their own. Sometimes to a fault, but 
That's a different discussion for a different day. But even though police were out in full force to try and find this man, and even though Amy was able to give them a fairly detailed description of him, and she was able to give him some clothing that had her assailant's um, DNA on it, Unfortunately, they were still unable to identify who attacked her that day. They followed a few initial leads, but none of them ended up turning into anything useful. And obviously we know that the DNA sample didn't generate any matches in the criminal database at the time of the attack. So Amy's case went cold for 20 years, right up until they busted Grant for James' murder, got his DNA and matched it to the DNA left behind by Amy's and I could not cover this case without taking a minute to give credit to the main detective, Detective Hayes Minor. Because when the statute of limitations was close to running out for Amy's case, which I guess was six years, rather than just throw his hands up and admit defeat, Detective Minor actually went to a judge and requested basically like a John Doe arrest warrant for whomever's DNA had been recovered from Amy. I guess Detective Minor was so sure that whoever had attacked Amy would reoffend that no matter how long it took, he wanted to make sure that he could nail this guy with rape charges. We all know that crimes have a statute of limitations, but arrest warrants for said crimes those don't expire. So as long as Detective Minor got the John Doe warrant, which thankfully he did, he essentially had an indefinite amount of time to track down who we now know to be Grant. It's definitely a massive loophole in the system, but given how it worked out here, it's a loophole I am definitely glad exists. That said, while obviously, yes, it's fantastic that they did finally link the crime to Grant. I still feel so bad for Amy that, okay, she was 27 when it happened and it took them almost 21 years to catch him, which means that Amy had to live weighed down by this trauma and desperate for answers almost just as long as she'd gotten to live peacefully before this jackass. And I don't know why that in particular bothers me so much, but it's it's just fucked up. Following her attack, she had to take time away from work. She had trouble sleeping. She was terrified to leave her house. Her marriage suffered so much so that they actually ended up getting divorced. I mean, she was just totally and completely broken by this. I just, for him to get 20 extra years of freedom to not only go on to live his own life, but then he also went on to take someone else's. It's just really frustrating. And of course it doesn't stop there because Grant's sentence is also super frustrating and super annoying. Okay, so he's serving 30 years for James' murder. Then he pleads guilty to the rape for which he's sentenced to 50 years. But what's absolutely ridiculous and obnoxious about this is that the judge set those sentences to run concurrently. So at the same time. So what that all boils down to is that given the minimums for each of Grant's sentences, he only has to serve 35 years before he's eligible for parole. So he's eligible for release in like his mid eighties, which sure, that's a long time, but I really don't think he should be eligible for parole ever. I really think his sentence is a hot, steamy pile of bullshit. Sorry, not sorry. All right, so where are they now? Grant is in his 50s. He's serving his time at the minimum to medium security North Central unit in Calico Rock, Arkansas. He, um, he doesn't look like he's doing well. Kind of looks like he's wasting away in prison, but he did complete an anger management course in 2019. So, um, uh, whatever. I can't even pretend to care. Linda is still steadfast in her love and support for her husband. The most recent records I can find were from 2021. And as far as those date, they're still married. And she even still lives in the same house that they lived in at the time of James' murder. And she just apparently refuses to believe that he's guilty of anything, which I kind of think is just a front. I think deep down she knows he's guilty, but the reality of it all is just too painful for her to come to terms with. I've seen people call her an idiot for still proclaiming his innocence, and I don't necessarily think that that's fair. I can't imagine being in her position, and I don't think a lot of people realistically can. I could totally see how it would be insanely difficult to acknowledge that the man you loved and built your life with is actually a monster. She did liken seeing Grant and Shackles to Jesus being walk to his crucifixion. So, I mean, her denial is extreme, but I guess that's her prerogative. Ooh, um, good news. Detective Minor was eventually promoted to chief of police. So 
that was definitely well deserved. Amy eventually got to face Grant in court, which was a day of vindication that she had waited over two decades for. She bravely and strongly read him her victim impact statement in which she told him that she would, quote, use her free will to overcome the evil he did to her. And she seems pretty at peace with the closure she's received, and she hopes that her story will serve as encouragement to other survivors who are still fighting for justice. And as for James, while well, I can't give you an update on him, I would like to tell you just a little bit about who he was. James Lee Appleton was 59 when his life was senselessly taken. He left behind a wife, one son, two daughters, and four siblings. He worked as a supervisor at Emerson Electric for almost 30 years before he moved on to working as a carpenter for 12. And from carpentry, he moved on to working for the city of Gateway. He was a dedicated member of his church, and in his spare time, he enjoyed fishing and woodworking. He's greatly missed by his family and friends who desperately try to remember him as he was in life. And with that, I think we are about wrapped for today. Let me know your thoughts on this case in the comments down below. Ooh, one thing specifically, let me know if you think Grant committed any other crimes in between his two crimes that he was just never caught for. Because my theory is, um, hell yeah, I think he did, but I'd love for you guys to sound off down below. If you haven't already and you'd like to, go ahead and subscribe to my channel and turn on the post notifications. I put out new videos every week and I'd love to catch you back here in my next one. But until then, stay safe and have a good week. Bye guys. Oh my God, I think I fixed it. Okay. Don't touch it. <laughs> I'm having a fucking panic attack. I'm having a fucking panic attack. Jane. <laughs> that is really patchy right there. What, what the fuck? Why? <clears throat> yeah. Almost overreacted. Do you guys like my new Christmas sweatshirt? Because it honestly might be one of my new favorite pieces of clothing. Love a Shit's Creek moment.